Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, I'll start out just by doing a quick introduction of myself. Um, my name is Dan Yonner. I'm a product manager at Pivotal. Um, I've been working on Cloud Foundry since early 2016, um, during which time I've uh, worked on two main projects, both of them sort of in the security realm. Um, the first one, which I had the opportunity to talk about last year at Summit, is CredHub. And um, most recently, I've moved on to the uh, security triage team, which focuses on uh, application security in Cloud Foundry and App Pivotal. Um, one of the things just top of my mind right now is thinking about how to integrate security-related automation and tooling into big development environments. So if you all have experience on that, um, I'd love to chat with you in the hallways. So the focus of my talk today is on application security of the platform in Cloud Foundry. Um, I'm going to start talking about the um, importance that I see of the community's contributions to security in the platform. Um, after that, I'll be talking about who I think should contribute, run through a quick start guide, just like a 101 on security testing if you're not familiar with how to do that. Um, and then finally, I'll wrap up talking about how to do disclosure in the event that you do um, find a security issue in, in Cloud Foundry. Um, let me just start by saying uh, security loves the community, right? Like the phrase that we often hear is like, with enough eyes, um, any bugs can be discovered or any bugs are shallow. Um, I think that really is one of the superpowers of having a community, right? If you have a lot of people looking at something, the more scrutiny, the more secure it's likely going to be. Um, Cloud Foundry has a lot of uh, enterprise members. We have uh, more than 60 member companies and hundreds of individual people contributing. Um, and the exciting part about that is we all have the opportunity to contribute to the security of the platform. Um, but one thing that I will mention, there's a little caveat to that, right? Um, the many eyes thing only works if we're actually engaged. So the whole point of this talk is to hopefully um, inspire to get you all to get more engaged in security in the platform so that um, we can find all of those bugs. Um, three areas in particular that I want to talk about for um, where I think the community can really make an impact uh, in challenges in Cloud Foundry. The, the first one is about complexity. Um, thinking of this as just like, specific platform level complexity or platform component level complexity. Um, we have a lot of really highly complex components in uh, Cloud Foundry and it, it's really hard to understand a lot of their like boundaries and features and interactions. And as that complexity grows, the likelihood of security issues with that, that functionality um, also grows alongside that. So, um, it's not necessarily bad. Um, a lot of times this is necessary, but where that complexity is necessary, I think a good counterbalance to that can be um, all of your interactions in the community to um, provide more scrutiny on that and provide more uh, auditing of the security of those components. Um, another area is around um, just like integration and variations. Um, if you deploy Cloud Foundry, you might see in like CF deployment, I think there are 2,500 lines of configuration. Um, and with each of those different settings, there's a possibility for different things to go wrong, right? Um, we do a really good job in CF deployment of shipping this really great product, um, but Relent can only test um, a certain number of configurations, right? Um, and it's not going to be the full breadth of all the configurations that are out there in the community. So I think uh, having the community do testing on their specific flavor of uh, Cloud Foundry is really important. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the reasons that that's important is like with these well-worn paths, we may make assumptions about different components um, contracts and how they interact with each other. And some of these custom deployments can like surface that those contracts aren't as well enforced as they should be. 
Um, and then the last area is um, diversity of experience. So um, a lot, large number of security vulnerabilities, uh, basically like the underpinnings are that you broke an assumption that someone had, right? So if you have a user sign up form and you assume that no one's gonna put drop table users as their first name, um, you might have a bad time, right? So generally speaking, people that have similar experiences are gonna have similar assumptions. So having a, a good diversity of people in the community um, is a good way to counter that. So like fresh eyes and new perspectives uncover a lot of things that are overlooked. Um, one thing I'll also mention is I think this also applies to security experience itself, which is to say like a cryptographer might be the best person to try to attack a system by like uh, predicting a random number generator and like using that to leverage attack, but also somebody that doesn't have specific ex experience in security might be able to discover that like there's a default user. And at the end of the day, if they both get to the same place, I think both of those are valuable things to research. All right, so who should consider um, contributing to security at Cloud Foundry? Um, hopefully you are listening to the, the previous point, which is I think everyone's experiences are really valid and I think diversity of experience is important. So um, you all, that's, that's the answer to that question. All right, so let's talk about how to contribute. So next few slides, I'm just gonna go over, um, if you don't have any experience in security, you're thinking like, hey, this might be a good idea, um, but you don't know where to start, this is like a, a testing 101. Um, but of course, I'll, I'll start with a disclaimer. So next few slides, I'm gonna talk about like uh, thinking about how you could do an attack and picking your target for attack. Like, one of the assumptions here is you're working on a local environment or an isolated environment. Um, if you don't have permission to do vulnerability assessments on a platform, um, it's likely illegal, so don't do that. Um, certainly unethical, if anything, so don't. All right, so first step um, is really about a mindset, right? Like, I've got a picture here of a bunny. Um, and if this is a normal bunny, it's gonna look at those uh, pegs and it's gonna say, I'm gonna get to the other side by jumping over those pegs. Um, but if it's a hacker bunny, it thinks, why do I go to all that work? I should just go right through. Like, I don't care about your access control. I wanna go from one side to the other. So first thing is thinking like a hacker. Um, don't focus on like positive scenarios. Don't focus on um, where you would expect it to work, you would have to focus on things that like are negative scenarios and edge cases. So um, that's the first thing. Um, a few things that I'll just point out as resources uh, that I thought were really interesting as a mind mindset uh, shift were um, the first one's uh, physical security testing. Um, it might sound a little bit counterintuitive, but um, the reason that I thought these resources are really um, interesting is because they're really engaging. Um, and also, it, it's one of those things where like, I've got a elevator and a door hacking link on here, and it, it's interesting to watch those and then look at things that you experience in your everyday life and think like, oh hey, I could hack this elevator. Like, it, it's an interesting thing, right? Um, especially when your intention is to, to change your mindset a bit. Um, and also I think a lot of these, these principles sort of carry over between the two. So like thinking about uh, the various points of entry, um, thinking about how those are secured, how they're authorized, um, overcoming different obstacles along the way and like chaining those together to get from point A to point B, um, I think translates well. Um, the other thing is there's this whole host of applications. A lot of them are hosted by OWASP um, where they basically like they build an app and they build it intentionally and securely so that you can go in and get some hands-on experience in doing different exploits. So you can, um, the ones that I've tried are OWASP Juice Shop, 
and uh, hack this site is also like a, just a site that you can visit without deploying anything. Uh, but those are really cool because they, they basically just make it a game, right? And, and uh, the fact that you're gonna succeed makes it a lot more fun. All right, so um, you're starting to think like a hacker. Um, the next thing you need to do is uh, start some actual testing. So the first thing that you might want to consider is uh, what sort of attack methods you're going to use. So one of the ways that you can go about this is uh, basically just like go to the OWASP top 10. If you're not familiar with this, this is a list of the most common vulnerabilities that are found in software. Uh, a way that you could go about this is like select a specific one that you're really interested in, like uh, thinking about injection, uh, thinking about the various types of injection that happen in applications, um, what sort of general attacks in injection look like, and then you could also explore some of the tooling that surrounds a lot of these, uh, a lot of these attacks. Um, a nice primer on that is there's this, uh, presentation by PagerDuty that I've linked up there. Uh, they walk through each of these different exploits and like get into a lot more detail about each of them. Um, another option that you have is uh, looking at historical vulnerabilities. So like if you basically look at all the vulnerabilities that exist, if you see, for example, that a specific component has been affected previously by SQL injection, um, a pretty reasonable assumption would be that that application doesn't have holistic protections for SQL injection. So if you wanted to narrow down your targets um, and see, uh, basically just like increase your odds of success, you might want to uh, look at historical vulnerabilities. Um, speaking of historical vulnerabilities, a uh, quick plug uh, today at 5.30, uh, Molly and Rupa are doing a talk, which I hear is not going to be recorded, uh, about the top five security vulnerabilities uh, that we've discovered in Cloud Foundry, so definitely go to that. Um, all right, so the, the last method that I'll mention here is just doing plain old uh, automated tooling testing. Um, I mentioned this, uh, but I will sort of uh, put a little caveat on it, which is a lot of these are really good at finding things, but they also find other things along the way that aren't very good. So um, if you do decide to use automated tooling, make sure you look at the end result and validate that they're actual security issues that you care about um, and not just uh, a configuration of your deployment or something like that. All right, so you've got a method. The next thing you want to do is uh, think about a target for your test. Um, this is really just a matter of like doing a, a bit of good research. Uh, you would want to be somewhat familiar with the application that you're testing. Um, do a little bit of research on all of its different behaviors and inter interactions and configurations. Um, and then also look at all of its interfaces. Um, if it has different APIs, different um, ways to interact with them. Um, each of those can be a different surface area. All right, then the last thing that you want to do is you want to perform the test. Um, basically, what you're looking for here is any change in behavior or response that compromises either confidentiality, which is information you shouldn't see based on who you are in the, in the attack, um, integrity, so if you can modify something that you shouldn't be able to modify, um, or availability. Like if you um, find a way to send three attacks and it falls over, that, that's certainly problematic. Um, some of these can be really subtle. Like if you send an attack and it uh, sends back an error message, but the error message includes details about the environment or something like that, that could be cause for a concern. So um, look out for subtle changes and uh, do a little bit more research. Um, the last thing that I'll mention is denial of service testing or like availability testing is one of the like outliers here, which is usually you don't want to do availability testing um, that basically just like throws a ton of load 
at a component. There are a lot of tools and services that prevent that sort of attack. So like just throwing a bunch of load at Cappy and seeing it fall over isn't super interesting or unexpected. Um, and then the last thing is around reporting. So as you're doing this testing, uh, a thing to point out is make sure that you uh, keep good logs of the tests that you're doing so that if you are successful, um, you can actually report it and it will be really easy for us to reproduce and really easy for us to fix. Um, testing can be really frustrating because 99% of the things that you're doing are going to fail, um, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, so if you finally do get a result that you think is a vulnerability, you wanna make sure that you're recording along the way to make sure that you can reproduce that. Um, and the other notes here that I'll reiterate in the disclosure section are, um, if you find a vulnerability, you're super excited about it, please do not disclose it publicly. Please don't create an issue on the component's GitHub. Um, don't create a PR even, even if you're trying to be helpful. Um, because uh, we want to follow a responsible disclosure process, which I'll talk about next. All right, so the last thing I'm going to cover is uh, responsible disclosure. So uh, basically what we encourage here is that people report vulnerabilities to us uh, privately. So um, if you find something, the concept of responsible disclosure is really just uh, disclosing to the maintainer of the software privately that you've uh, discovered something and giving them a reasonable amount of time to fix it before you start talking about it in public. So the idea is when we um, do the disclosure, hopefully we can also provide people in the community the fixed version so that they can remediate that at the same time that they know it's an issue. Um, and as part of that process, like we, we also do commit to disclosing vulnerabilities that are discovered in a reasonable amount of time. So if we uh, get a fix for something, the next step is like telling everyone that a vulnerability exists so that you can make a good judgment about when you want to update your systems um, so they're not vulnerable. Um, the disclosure and vulnerability process is really straightforward. It's just uh, starting with reporting, going through validation, uh, remediation, and then finally disclosure to the public. Um, hopefully, if you didn't take anything from this talk, uh, this is the one thing that you do, which is if you ever encounter a security vulnerability in Cloud Foundry, um, please do send an email to security at cloudfoundry.org to let us know. Um, and we'll research it and get back to you. Um, as, a, as a general rule of thumb here, err on the side of being more communicative than less. So like, if you see something and you're like, oh, I'm pretty sure, but not really sure, I don't wanna, I don't wanna bother them, um, change your mindset, definitely bother us, <laughs> send it to us, and uh, we're fine if it turns out not to be a vulnerability. A uh, quick shout out here to the security triage team. Um, these are my colleagues, the folks that I work with uh, every day. They handle both the open source uh, Cloud Foundry security stuff and also the security um, things with Pivotal. So um, if you send a report to us, you're likely gonna be talking to one of these folks. Um, I'm super biased, but I think they do great work. So I think you'll, uh, you'll be uh, surprised and delighted with the, the interaction. Uh, all right, so validation. So once you send us a report, we're gonna validate it. Um, this is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, basically, our intention here is to try to, to verify what you've sent to us. Um, our hope is that uh, we can really get a good uh, handle of the issue that you report and make sure that we can analyze any impacts that um, it has on the platform. Um, if it's unclear or if we don't know, we're gonna reach out to you and uh, ask some questions here, so uh, it'd be great if you report something to, to respond back to us. And then of course, remediation. So uh, if we are able to validate something, we work with the teams to produce fixes um, that, that patch that issue. Um, the time frame for this is gonna vary, um, but the main motivators here are 
primarily severity of the issue. Um, so if it's a critical or a high um, severity issue, we're going to start uh, working on it right away. We're going to have eyes on it, and we're going to try to get something out right away. Um, but then, of course, we also have to weigh the complexity of the fix. So um, the combination of those two de determine how quickly we uh, are able to remediate something. Lastly, once we've got fixes out, we've released something, we'll do the disclosure. Uh, this is primarily communicated uh, via the cloudfoundry.org website. Uh, if you go to cloudfoundry.org slash security, you'll see a bunch of security notices. Um, we do this shortly after a fix is available. Um, and we basically just do this so that um, as members of the community, you can look at this and say, um, I see this vulnerability was disclosed. I see what severity it is. I can make a really um, reasoned uh, decision about the risk of either patching or not patching that issue. And um, it's sort of up to you to do that. Um, but please do patch. Um, so all right, that's the end of the disclosure process. Uh, as I wrap up, I just want to say thank you to these community members that have uh, reported security issues to us over the past year. Um, Cloud Foundry is definitely more secure because of the involvement of the community. Um, but I will say, hopefully, I've inspired some of you to do uh, more testing and have a little bit more interaction with us um, in the open source uh, security side of things. And next year, I'll come back and I'll do a presentation called Community Love Security where I talk about all the cool reports that you all have submitted to us. Thanks for listening. <laughs>